Look at all these beautiful faces. Welcome fellow bee marketers. We're gonna give another minute or so for people to keep trickling in. Knowing how these normally go. Yeah, if people are joining, feel free to drop your name into the chat and maybe your location. And if you're interested in connecting uh, to anyone on LinkedIn, feel free to drop your profile in on the chat as well. I'm hoping we get pretty good coverage across the US and Canada today, given the, the fact that we're US Canada Marketers Network. And something tells me we'll have a strong showing from Wisconsin. All right, I'm, I'm ready to get started just in respect of everyone's time and knowing that we have a lot of stuff to get through. I wanted to, to start by welcoming everyone to the call. Um, we're really excited to have you all here for our impact storytelling webinar. Um, again, this is the US Canada B Corp Marketers Network. I'm Adrian Gershom. Um, I'm from Sea Change, um, which is a marketing consultancy, a B Corp marketing consultancy. Um, based on in the unceded lands of the Ojibwa, Adawa, and Potawatomi people, also known as Chicago. And um, uh, I am going to pass it to Tim Frick from Mighty Bites, who sometimes also is a Chicagoan, so that he can give a quick overview of what the B Corp Marketers Network is for those of you that might need a little more explanation. Thanks, Tim. Awesome. Thanks, Adrian. Hello, and welcome, everybody. Uh, my name is Tim Frick, uh, and I'm a co-founder of the B Corp Marketers Network here, uh, which is sponsoring today's event. Um, the U.S. and Canada B Corp Marketers Network is a professional network within the B Corp community. Um, as a professional network, our purpose is to increase a sense of community, collaboration, and partnerships between U.S. and Canada-based B Corp marketers. Uh, we're also here to amplify and educate consumers and businesses about the unique value of B Corp certification. Um, we are here to share best practices, tools, and expertise that allow purpose-driven marketers to succeed and prove the ROI of their work. And finally, we're here to emphasize and adhere to ethical marketing best practices, uh, which is a collective impact that we hope to create with today's Lunch and Learn, as well as the network overall. Um, if you'd like to learn more about B Corp certification, uh, I think there's a lot of B Corps on this call already. But if you aren't a B Corp and, and are here, uh, welcome and please visit bcorporation.net. If you're already a part of the B Corp community and would like to learn more about this network, uh, join and follow our group on the Beehive. Um, and finally, I'm going to drop a, a link into, uh, into the chat here. Our last webinar just a few weeks ago was on fossil fuel green washing. Um, and you can find that here at this YouTube link. Um, and so I'll share that. Link. And now, thank you, Adrian. Back to you. Great. Thanks so much, Tim. Becca, if you don't mind advancing the slide, uh, I want to run through the agenda and do some quick housekeeping notes. I neglected to mention that uh, like many of these calls, this one is being recorded uh, for posterity so that you can reference it and also for the attendees that couldn't make it. Um, in terms of the run of the show today, uh, there are a few things that we'd love to get through and we're hoping to, we've got a lot to cover. So uh, we're in the welcome and intros phase now. Um, I'll be going to pass uh, things off in a minute for everyone to introduce themselves as panelists. Uh, and then we'll be walking through a series of questions that deal with impact storytelling. Um, the uh, focus will be on three different topic areas for those questions. So we'll be looking at 
uh, the categories of audience, messaging, and then inspiration. And we'll be doing uh, two questions for each of those categories. Uh, after we wrap that up and with about 15 to 20 minutes left, ideally, we'll get to Q&A. So please get your um, questions ready so that we can have a chance to address as many of those as possible when we get to that portion of the webinar. And then we'll conclude with uh, uh, talking about some next steps, uh, including um, providing a link to, uh, if not during this webinar, for sure, as a follow up by email. Uh, some resources that we've put together for the attendees of this call so that uh, you have it as a, as a reference point. Um, so with that, I would love to um, uh, advance to the next slide, Becca, if you don't mind. And uh, what I wanted to do with this is, is to do some context setting. So uh, I think one of the things that's really um, great about us as a community is um, the values that we stand for. I think what's important for us to understand as we dive into the topic of impact storytelling and how we talk about ourselves as businesses is looking at the landscape of what's out there now and what hopefully is um, in counterpoint to what we do as a community. And so the narrative that is out there now for business as usual businesses is largely a narrative that is coming from a white perspective. So looking at some statistics that we put together here, you think about the TV shows that we watch, the books we read, the music that we hear, the news that we see on our devices, um, the voices that create those things are largely white voices. And that's you know, nothing new to us, but it's worth noting because as we talk about what it's like to create a, a different kind of story or a different kind of narrative, um, and, on the next slide. Um, what we're really talking about is what does it look like to tell a story from the perspective of our community, the B Corp community? What might our stories look like? Um, and those are stories that are coming from coming from centered, centering different and diverse voices. They're stories that value climate justice, racial equity, and stakeholder governance. And so we have to ask ourselves those very important questions as we begin to think about what it means to tell an impact story, which we're looking to do as marketers, is how do we blend those values, those important sorts of criteria into the narratives that we're creating so that we can offer a counterpoint to those um, traditional business as usual sorts of narratives that are out there in the marketing place, marketplace. Um, so what I'd like to do next is to Welcome our very distinguished panel on the next slide, Becca. Um, so I'm, I'm incredibly thankful to be sharing today's webinar with a very accomplished group of leaders from our B Corp community. Um, Lisa Giesenbauer from Evolution Marketing, August Ball from Cream City Conservation, Kendra Peavy from Bold Co, and Rochelle Guistella from Art, Artisan Dental. Um, each of these panelists will be sharing their knowledge about the topics that we'll be going through today. And um, I'm thankful for you all being here. So I'm gonna pass it to Lisa to first talk about herself, her company, and uh, you know, set, set the tone for telling our impact stories. Thanks, Lisa. Thank you, Adrian, and welcome everyone. Um, next slide, please, Becca. So for those who don't, don't know me, I'm pictured in the middle of the slide. I have a face mask on. I'm holding a certificate in this picture. And um, I'm standing next to my 2021 intern, Lena, who's an undergrad at UW-Madison. And we're at the Wisconsin Sustainable Business Council conference last year. And in last December, we're getting the Green Master's Program Certificate. Uh, and for those of you who, who don't know me, I've been really involved with sustainability in Wisconsin for the last 15 years. and. Um, to me, sustainability is a discipline that is so important. And as an impact storyteller, the work that we're doing is really unique because I'm not only a sustainability consultant, but I'm also a marketing communications person who literally is only working, doing Marcom work in the sustainability space. So I'm a kind of a niche within a niche. And this is important because in order to tell environmental stories and sustainability stories, you have to understand what you're talking about and you have to be able to market it as Adrian said. So for the last 15 years with Evolution Marketing, we've been working really hard to 
change the narrative and to really address a lot of miscommunications and misunderstandings about what true holistic sustainability is. Sustainability is not just social and it's not just environmental. It's, it's together, it's connected and it's holistic. Um, so the other thing about me is that I'm uh, one of the co-founders of Be Local Wisconsin and I'm currently our chair. So if anyone's in Wisconsin who's interested in B Corps, let me know. Next slide, please. Real quick about evolution marketing. Our mission is live responsibly, work by example, lead by design and educate through action. And included in the slides today are a couple of the impact reports we put out over the last couple of years. And if you're looking for ideas, please download these with videos here, we've got reports. The best thing you can do in my mind is if you see something you like, copy it. Because I think that's what also makes us as the B Corp community different. We want to share our ideas. And so if something, if you see something that's working for you in one of my reports, borrow it, okay? Um, the other thing is that, uh, next slide, please. One of the things that to me is incredibly important when we're talking about the storytelling and impact storytelling is really to showcase the partners that we're working with in the process. So these are pictures from earlier this year. I had an eco open house in my home and I worked with Oconomowoc High School kids. And so pictured in these images are Oconomowoc High School uh, seniors in the AP Environmental Science and um, uh, Spanish language five classes. And they worked with me to help tell the story of what we're doing at our home. And again, this is another way of I'm taking the voices of the youth and I'm helping to share their voices and their storytelling with the world. So just some examples of the way we do work maybe a little bit differently here at Evolution Marketing. We are ready now to go to the next speaker who I believe is August Ball, my friend, August. Hi everyone, uh, my name is August Ball and I am the founder and CEO of Queen City Conservation, also based here in uh, on the ancestral lands of the Menominee and Potawatomi people um, in, in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. So Queen City Conservation is a two-pronged social enterprise. We are also Wisconsin's first Black-owned certified B Corp. Uh, we take the sorry. We work with environmental organizations addressing their diversity crisis around hiring and retention, and we use the proceeds from that work to pay young adults here in Milwaukee to do land stewardship uh, service to public lands and also get paid to be trained in careers in sustainability. Um, next slide, please. Thanks. So our vision for the world uh, is a city, a country, a world full of planetary denizens and social justice advocates. Um, sorry, one moment. Let me see if I can <laughs> pause some, uh, some sound in the back. This is real world, friends. <laughs> um, <laughs> So next slide, please. <laughs> so for my company, it's not just important that we prepare the next generation of environmental leaders. As Adrian pointed out, uh, you know, the not only are is the general population historically white in terms of whose voices and uh, thoughts and ideas uh, get presented to the forefront, we also see this in the norms of everyday workplaces, right? Uh, and so it's not enough for a company like mine to get young people of color, folks of marginalized identities excited about a career in sustainability. We also have to prepare the existing industry for doing work differently because historically it has been designed for white middle-class people. Um, and so that is the demographic that tends to thrive in a traditional workplace. And we know that in reality, when it's all said and done, even the traditional, or should I say, the most common way of doing business and professionalism, that's not working for most of us, regardless of our racial and ethnic identity, which is why we're seeing, you know, this great resignation, right? So, um, so again, for my organization, we want to change the face of conservation by you know, engaging young people of color in hands-on service to public lands and preparing the industry for that talent. And I will turn it to our next speaker, which I believe is Kendra. Hi there, thanks so much. Um, my name is Kendra Peavy. I am the founder of BoldCo, a purpose consultancy and the former head of global communications and sustainability at Swell, the reusable products company. 
Um, I also happen to be one of the co-founders of the Marketers Network, and I um, have just loved the experience of meeting so many of um, in the individuals on this uh, webinar today and working with Adrian and Tim. Um, over the last 20 years, I've had the pleasure of <clears throat> working with brands like Swell to create movements around reusables, using integrated marketing, storytelling, best practices, partnerships, and really impact, uh, strategic impact programming to um, not only help displace 4 billion single-use plastic bottles, but reach 1.5 million youth and so much more. And today I work closely with um, founders, entrepreneurs, uh, brand teams and individual teams and, and diving deeper into purpose, not only understanding what it means, but and how to position it, how to articulate it, and how to integrate it into programming for more impact. Um, so at Bold Co, we, we cultivate bold voices and we co-create sustainable change and work very hard to not only help individuals and brands overcome fear of being vocal about impact storytelling, <clears throat> excuse me, but also um, really trying to shift mindsets from going beyond mitigating risk. Uh, if you're a communicator, you know what I'm talking about and really moving into um, radical innovation in terms of how you approach sustainable storytelling and, and sustainable business today. I'm gonna pass it on to Rochelle. Thanks, Kendra. Welcome everybody. Um, I'm Rochelle Gostella. I am the director of business development at Artisan Dental here in Madison, Wisconsin. Um, I think my role is just slightly different than the other panelists here. My primary role is more of a dental role and working that business. So the sustainability portion is an adjunct of what I do, but it's an important one here at Artisan. Um, we started in 2014 and right away our owners knew when we started this business that we wanted to uh, be looking at all of our stakeholder or all of our share stakeholders excuse me stakeholders and um, we wanted to be running an ethical and sustainable business um, so i've been in the dental industry for over 25 years and i recently won an award from adom which is a, a a dental office managers organization. It's a national organization. And I won the Green Leader Award just this last year. It's still in effect in September at Rolls. So if you wanna go to the next slide, please. So at Artisan, our mission is to optimize the health and happiness of our patients, team members, suppliers, community, and the environment through exceptional quality dental care and sustainable business practices. And like I said, the zest for this comes from the owners. So it makes it really easy for us as um, team members because we know we have the backing of the leadership here to do that. Um, the one thing we're super proud of is that we were the first dental office in the nation to become carbon neutral. Um, so really excited about that. And we also received the 2020 and 2021 um, Dane County Climate Champions Awards, a lot of that based off of the fact that we went carbon neutral. Also a shout out to Lisa, um, their company did our uh, impact reports and they did a fabulous job. So thank you so much for that. Um, but because of that, she submitted us and we won some awards through them, the Marcom Awards. So um, a, a wonderful example of working together and promoting each other and how that all comes full circle. Um, so that's a little bit about us. Um, this just shows us that a couple of the photos there just uh, volunteering at Second Harvest Food Bank in our area. Uh, we did a, a fundraiser where we did a walk with our pets. So that's kind of what's going on there. A couple of, couple of photos of the office. All right, thank you panelists. I appreciate you all giving the audience a chance to better understand your backgrounds, uh, both personally and professionally. Uh, and with that, we'll jump right into the questions. So this first section, like I mentioned um, at the outset is focused on audience. And so the first question that I'm gonna pose to the panel uh, really is about how we might find and engage audiences that matter to us as purpose-led marketers. I mean, we know the numbers have been growing um, and it's, it's a promising trend that the marketplace is becoming a more conscious marketplace. 
Um, but I think it helps to understand what the those consumers look like and how we can better engage with them. So I'd love to start with some thoughts that you have, Lisa, around your experiences in this area. Thank you, Adrian. Um, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about what we call the CPG space, so the consumer packaged goods space, because many of the evolution marketing clients that we work with are in this space. And what's amazing to me, and I'm sure we've all heard this, this data point, that the most likely person to buy something organic or that has a third party environmental certification is going to be a new mother because she is concerned about her baby and she wants to make sure her baby has the best of, of whatever, whether it's baby food or diapers or clothing. Um, so I think that's interesting because I think that also speaks to then what's going on in the CPG space. So what we've seen recently, and I, um, I have to say, um, this, this statement I'm gonna share next is really interesting. Um, I work with um, Rebel Green. And so one of the co-founders Rebel Green actually just went to a webinar where she got this information. So I have to give Melina Marcus credit for sharing this information with me. Um, but one of the, the hottest topics right now in the CPG space is the fact that consumers are concerned about what is in the items they consume, what is it in the items that they put on their body and what are the types of impacts those items have on the environment around them. So it's in, on and around is kind of a new way for marketers to think about um, how their consumers are concerned about what's going on with their product or the impacts of their product on the bigger space. Um, for me, the take home message is that we as marketers really need to have a simple, clean um, message that we put out. And it doesn't have to be complicated and complex. We have cool tools such as QR codes and or sustainability reports and or links to other things to help raise awareness with consumers. So my advice, and this is what we've been doing with several of our clients is on marketing labels, for example, or on um, a poster or a sign that you might have at the grocery store or at an event. You, you short, sweet message about the sustainability or the impact benefits of your product. And then you place a QR code there or a link to a website so that if the consumer wants more information, they can click that QR code. And then at that landing page, when I'm calling it a microsite, you literally place all the detailed information you want. So that way if the consumer wants to get that information, they're, they're able to, but if they don't, if, if that's not important to them, they see the statement and it's clear and understandable because we don't want to confuse the consumer because it already as it is, it's challenging due to the fact that there are so many different claims that are made out there. There's over 3,500 different third-party certifications in this space. So hopefully that, that makes sense. It's kind of like a primer to start this conversation. I'd love to jump in and add too, um, there's been some, some recent studies coming out of the UK and, and other areas that have some interesting insights as well to, to build on Lisa's, Lisa's information there. So Deloitte UK just came out this year with a study um, that stated the five top brand values that, that consumers are looking for. And they were tied to um, sustainable packaging, reducing waste in manufacturing, committing to ethical work practices, reducing carbon footprint and ethical human practices. And we've definitely seen over the last two years with COVID, the S and ESG becoming more and more um, critical not only from a consumer perspective, but from a, a company perspective as well. And another study that I thought was interesting conducted by Simon Kucher and Partners, which fielded 10,000 plus um, individuals around the globe on sustainability practices, um, showed that 61% of US consumers are using sustainability as they, a, con, a consideration when buying, which Adrian, to your point earlier, we know it, we see it, but it's always good to be reminded of it as stat, new stats come out. And um, with that, their study also did uh, reiterate the importance of, of younger generations in making these in making sustainable um, purchases, being a driving force there. With uh, millennials driving driving willing to pay more, as well as Gen Z for sustainable products, and yet we're finding that um, sustainability obviously isn't number one yet. So we've got to keep storytelling, educating to drive it so that it's, um, you know, becoming the number one consideration versus the price or quality uh, as well in the mix. All right, I think uh, we're going to keep things moving. It actually, I was felt like there was a nice segue that was offered up there and I'm going to jump on it. And that is, you know, the question about 
uh, how we can really grow the market effectively. That's kind of what we're looking at with this question in terms of encouraging more consumers to make their decisions based on a company's impact. And uh, I think one of the signs that we're seeing, and, and uh, Lisa and Kendra touched on this, is that a lot of that is being driven by um, younger consumers. And I, and I thought this would be a great opportunity for August to maybe speak to um, some of the work that she's doing to engage the youth. Um, it's not, I don't know, I'm not going to try and put words in your mouth, August, but it almost seems like in some ways you're creating new consumers by engaging them. And I know there's many things that you're doing as part of that work, but um, I'd love to hear your thoughts on how engagement with younger consumers and, and younger people um, basically gives us a chance to propel ourselves forward. Sorry about that, still muted. Um, you'd think after two years of this, I'd have this down. Um, <laughs> yeah, so I am so fortunate to be able to live both in the world of teens and you know professional adults who are you know well into their careers. And I just chatted in um, a link to a document that talks about how Gen Z, um, so those born you know between what is it. Uh, 1995, I have to look at it. But, 1997, um, 1997. Ooh, I'm aged, I'm, I'm, now I feel old. Um, but yes, 1997 to the early 2000s, um, that they are, you know, the top consumers of sustainability products and the, the top driver to Lisa's point of, of, um, uh, of a community that purchases based on the values of the company. So for those of you who don't live in the world of teens, let me just tell you that no one is more obsessed with fairness, with equity, with justice than young people, than teens. So they're already consumers, um, you know, and I have the pleasure of working with young adults in the space of they're experiencing their first job for the first time. They have their own money for the first time, and they're getting exposed to um, alternative uh, products and companies uh, that they can spend and vote, you know, with their dollars on uh, with regards to the values that are presented, which means they are expecting the companies that they vote with their dollars uh, with to be clear about what they stand for and what they stand against. And if that's not clear to a teen, they're less likely to purchase from that company. I might add just one thing too, is I think it's important to show people that you don't necessarily have to sacrifice one or the other. You can have both a great product or service and support change all in the same you know you can go to any dental office in the nation but if you come here your dollars are being put towards making some changes too okay i'm just gonna jump in on top of that because it's not only the gen zers have these values but the gen zers expect this from their workplaces and i think rochelle you just touched on that inadvertently not only from a consumer standpoint but the workers that you're able to recruit for artists and dental they want younger professionals want to work at your company because of the good giving back and um, transparency that artists and dental does with telling your sustainability story so i mean this is really it's a it's a holistic thing you know it's it's not just about selling a message to, to the public it's about your whole system, right? And how does your business from the top down, how does it tell that story outside? You know, it's internal communication and it's external communication. Yeah, and thank it's you about, so much for that. Oh, I'm sorry, August, I was just gonna say, and adding in the personal elements and education um, into the process is really important. Um, it, you want to you want to engage with heart and mind and um, going beyond the facts. I love data. I love facts, but going beyond it to really story tell about how the 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 decisions you're making as a company or as a team um, and what you stand for and represent are impacting individuals, whether near or far. Um, and it's really important and can drive and can do um quite a bit to, to, to improve engagement and uh, feedback and create a feedback loop in the process. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I was just going to add that, you know, um, within our companies, we also have a responsibility when it comes to impact storytelling to co-create other storytellers within our organization. Yes. 
right? Um, because if we're not living out those external values internally, right, then we can be called to the mat, right, for, for, for sure. um, you know, for not meeting that. Um, and so that also means that for those of us who are, you know, the, the, the people um, managers in our organizations, we have a responsibility to cultivate the unlearning, perhaps, that some of our staff may come to us with. Um, as an example, you know, I hire a lot of college students, teachers um, uh, over our summer program. And one of the first things we do in, in week one is educate and promote a space of unlearning this mindset of as an employee, your job is to, you know, show how much you can output, right? And to burn yourself out. And we talk about how just as we want sustainability for public lands um, and for our environment, we want to run a sustainable business in terms of how we manage human energy and capital as well. And so our goal is not to extract all the profits. Our goal is to be profitable and purposeful um, and beneficial for the planet and for people. And that means that we have to, you know, continue building an awareness and an appreciation for our mutual humanity. Thank you guys. Two, a couple of things that stood out to me that I just wanted to surface again, because I think they're really noteworthy is the, the idea of marketing being marketers for B Corp community being a more holistic thing, right? That it's not just about the external marketplace, it's a holistic understanding of how we engage with all of our stakeholders. So that's a really, really incredible differentiator, I think, for our community and our practice. And then also another differentiator being that this is kind of a long game, right? Like sustainability and social justice is not something that happens overnight. And that if our future is in the youth and, and um, younger generations, that you know this is a long, long game that we're playing, and we need to pay attention to that and invest in it now, you know, to see those dividends later. Um, I'm ready to move on to the next section, which is the topic of messaging. So this is a very uh, meaty area to dig into. Um, we're, Really, what we mean by messaging here is specifically about you know, what are what are the things that we're communicating with our stakeholders. You know, going back again to the idea of stakeholder engagement. Um, what are the stories that we're telling to them, and how how is that being done? And the first question that I'll ask relative to that is, you know, thinking about the variety of different sorts of companies that we all represent, right? So we're all coming from different experiences, different lived experiences and different sorts of corporate experiences, B2B, B2C, product, service, different industries. There's all these different ways that businesses manifest in the world. Um, does that mean that we need to adjust our messaging based on those things or, or can it stay similar? And I'd love to um, understand um, what you think about that, Kendra, specifically? So I, you know, I've, I have a strong opinion about this because when you think about impact, it, it is about your brand first and foremost. If you're doing, um, if, you're, if your impact programming is strategic, it's often, it means that means it's authentic. It's personal to your brand and your company and what you're, you're trying to change and, and do in the world. So when it comes to storytelling, or yes, your, your impact program will evolve over time as your company matures, new team members come in, influence who you are and what you stand for, et cetera. But so when it comes to the actual storytelling, there is an essential element to your story that, that doesn't change. But what you do do, regardless of what type of industry you're in or, or um, whether you're a B2B or a direct to consumer is, is you, you, you adjust for your for your audience that you're 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 speaking to, right? And before you get into the adjusting for that audience, I think it's really important and it's and a really great way to simplify uh, what might seem like a really complex uh, challenge, perhaps depending on how robust your program is or what you know all that you stand for, is just to remember that no matter whether you're um, a vendor, a client, a team member, you we are all consumers. And what, what works with storytelling with consumers, again, it's authenticity, it's being personal, it's storytelling in a way that's relatable 
impactful, sharing, educating, sharing data, et cetera. But having worked for a lot of direct to consumer as well as um, B2B brands representing them as well and uh, hybrids of both, I think it's really important to think about what elements you share in, in that stakeholder and what they're trying to get out of it. I think it's um, safe to say that everyone on this call is looking for ways to, to lean into good, right? So how can you help from a B2B perspective, your customers or your vendors lean into good. They want the halo effect of the greatness that you're investing in, whether it's B Corp or 1% or for the planet or um, helping your local charities through CSR programming or internal development programs. So making sure that, that what you're communicating to them resonates, brings added value to them, allows them to tell your story to others and create kind of a pride of partnership. From a consumer perspective, again, how can you not only share the data to make sure that it's that it's um, that, that the programming that you're sharing and, and the general impact message that you're putting out in the world is backed by valid data, measurement, reports, et cetera, but educating and again inspiring with unique stories to tell um, of the people. Uh, that you're impacting or the people within the regions where there's sustainability and environmental programs going on. I'd like to add too to what Kendra just said. One of the things that I've been called on to do over time that I don't think most marketers do is I've worked with my clients who are farmers to help folks who are doing the distribution houses for them. So to explain the certifications they have. So what does a human animal certification mean? What does that look like? And so I've literally been brought in to do educational programming with my clients, supply chain and the vendors that they're working with so they could better leverage the story. And that's exactly what Kendra's talking about. Again, how we may be different is that as B Corp folks, we lean in and we work up and down our supply chain and up and down with our partners. And so we help our partners to do well so that we're all in this together. You know, we're all leaning in together. I think that might be a bit different than um, more traditional, larger corporations where it's us versus them. That's not the way, at least I think, I don't believe Kendra thinks that way either. No, it's about being in service. So you're in service to the, to the, to the impact store, to the impact programming that you're developing as a company, a team, an individual. And then how is that, you know, doing good for others? How can others parlay that and use that to do more good as well. I like to, it's a little bit of a ripple effect, but from a business point of view in terms of storytelling and sharing that service mindset. Um, I'd just like to add one thing too. We send out surveys to all of our um, stakeholders to get a better idea of how we're doing and what, our, what their, the impression is of us. So I, I would recommend that as a, a way to um, try to understand what what your image is in other people's eyes. And um, maybe that will help you to redefine your strategy as to what you wanna do in the future. All right, great, thank you all. I wanted to move on to the next question, which actually could be and often is its own <laughs> webinar. So there's a lot to cover here. We won't try and do it all with this one question. In fact, I think Tim shared a link to a really great webinar that happened recently um, with the Marketers Network that talked about um, how as marketers we can, um, you know, look at our own portfolio of clients and uh, ensure that we're not, you know, contributing to the fossil fuel problem. So that's definitely in the mix, but when we're, we're for the purposes of this question, really trying to understand as a group and, and hear the experiences of the, of the panel relative to trying to understand what's real in quotes relative to impact and, and what tools and frameworks that we as marketers should be looking to use to make sure that whatever messages and stories that we're putting out into the marketplace and with our stakeholders, that they're actually credible and legitimate and not sort of hyperbole or, or engaging in other things, even if we're not trying to do that. So I'd love to um, throw it to Rochelle, uh, knowing that you had some great thoughts on this particular area. Yeah, I have a couple of thoughts on this. So first of all, I think it's important to back up your claims. Um, you've got to be able to show that what you're saying is the truth. And so, you know, things like photos of actual projects that you're doing, um, using third-party validations, 
um, testimonials from people that you're working with. Um, so for us, when we got uh, our carbon neutral status, we used carbon credit capital to be our third party verification. So they can understand that we really did do what we were saying we're doing. Um, the other thought I have is I think you have to, you have to develop a really strong strategy and that strategy has to include everyone on the team. So you wanna include all of the departments and, under, and you have to collaborate and talk and get ideas together so that everybody's on the same page. And I, I feel personally that every single team member needs to be on that page. They need to understand it so that they're living it. Um, people that don't have that same philosophy probably aren't going to fit within our organization because it's a really strong commitment that we have here. Um, also, I think if you ask for their input, you're gonna get better engagement out of your team members too. If it's their idea, they don't wanna see it fail either. So they're gonna be really engaged and they're gonna go out and putting all the minds that you have to work and all the diversity that you have within your organization also I think is super important. Um, no matter what our lives have been, we've all lived different lives and had different experiences and we all think in different ways. And so these are all things that are important in putting together that strategy. Um, so uh, as an example, I had here, we have an oral um, healthcare recycling program here. It's the first of anything like it in our county. Um, people can bring in their, you know, use toothbrushes, toothpaste tubes, that sort of thing. So um, as soon as they do that, then we are sending that into TerraCycle, keeps it out of the landfill, but then TerraCycle also gives us points for each of those items and that converts into dollars that we then can direct to one of our local nonprofit partners. So it has impact in that it's diverting waste from the landfill. It's creating opportunity for cash donations to the local nonprofits. It's hitting our mission. Uh, we're using sustainable business practices. And then it's a part of our vision. It's creating conditions for all of our stakeholders to flourish in that the local nonprofits and the planet are, are flourishing because of that. So looking to see how does that fit into your mission, vision, values, your goals, all of those things. Um, I think those are all important. And once you have all that strategy put together, I think then the team will really make it happen and they'll be authentic in that. And I'd like to add too to Rochelle's point, think about your team, right? So we don't know what we don't know. And for the vast majority of us, if we were to list out the top 10 people we spend the most time around, their social demographics are gonna be probably fairly similar to our own, right? Similar gender, similar marital status, similar ability, similar um, education background, income, right? Um, and so that can create very much so of a, a silo, uh, so to speak. And, and we like working with people who are like us, right? We, we all have affinity bias, none of us are um, absolved from it, but we see what happens when companies don't have a dynamic and diverse team, right? We saw this occur with H&M's monkey t-shirt ad or Walmart's Juneteenth ice cream or Nike's Jap Japan commercial, right? Those are very clear indicators to your, your clients, your consumers, that some work on the inside was not done, right? So, you know, we we want to think about this from the perspective of, of prevention, <laughs> right? Uh, against being accused of woke washing, rainbow washing, et cetera. Um, so, so really checking in on, you know, to, to Kendra and Rochelle's point, are you living those values that you're proclaiming, right? It's one thing to turn your logo rainbow in June, but if you're not offering, you know, um, domestic partner uh, health insurance, <laughs> for example, then you're not walking the talk. You're not walking the walk. Um, so, you know, as as the the famous three year old on that meme said, like, worry about yourself, <laughs> right? Like, do the <laughs> internal work first, and then you know, present outwards. And again, not that we're going to do this perfectly, right? Um, if you're looking around your team right now and you're you're going, oh gosh, August is right. We are pretty much clones of ourselves that's a flag, right? Like to start working on that. Think about how can you engage input 
from a from a diverse set of of thoughts, right? Uh, um, differently, uh, because we know that when when teams are are diverse from from a multitude of social demographics, they're smarter, they're more innovative, they they preemptively um, uh, uh, perceive potential problems before they they hit your your organization. So yeah, start with your team too, if if you if you haven't already done that. That's a great point, August. The, the, the data is out there on the power of diversity. And, and speaking of data, just to back up some of what was just being said with the panel, one of the things that I've seen that's really helpful is not just putting the data out there, but the methodology that you used so that the people that are consuming your information have the opportunity to provide you feedback on where you might have had gaps or you know, unintended um, extrapolations or assumptions that you, you weren't trying to create. So. It's not just the data, it's also the story behind it. Um, given the amount of time we have left, I'm gonna turn this into a little bit of a speed round and conflate the final two questions because they're in some ways very related. It's kind of two sides of the same coin around inspiration in terms of, you know, as we look out into the community, not just, you know, the B Corp community necessarily, but even the wider world, trying to understand, um, what companies might be doing a great job of telling their impact stories and you know related to that the, the other question um that will fold into the first one is are there cautionary tales out there of things that are being done um august mentioned a, a few things around you know the, the kind of lip service like things with basically updating a logo without doing anything else but love to hear from the panel maybe starting with you august again about um either inspirations or cautionary tales that we should be aware of as marketers? Yes, so, you know, in my B2B um, business, I we do assessments with organizations around their company culture, who feels like they belong, don't belong. Are there any gaps in those experiences, for example? And once we do that and they get their results back, the first question I typically get is, how do we stack up against our competition? How do we stack up against the industry? Um, and while that's important information to know, um, far too often do I see organizations and companies being heralded as, you know, best in class or, you know, which I, I despise that term um, because who's who's determining that, <laughs> right? Uh, but th the problem with that is that any one of us can be flavor of the year, right? One moment and then make a mistake. And all of a sudden, you know, here come the torches. <laughs> so, yes, use, you know, use other organizations for inspiration. But my recommendation is get a benchmark on how your organization, your company is doing and compare that against your desired future state and have that be the goal rather than we want to be just like Apple. Or we want to be just like whatever, right? Because it's only a matter of time before that company gets dragged through the mud too, right? And, and that's a whole nother <laughs> webinar, right? Of making amends when we do make a mistake, because that's also what keeps us so stuck from actually being vocal about our values as a company, especially when we think it could cause some tension, right? But if we're sitting on the fence, then we serve no one, <laughs> right? So yeah, get a benchmark of who you are who, and compare that against who you want to actually be and have that be the goal rather than idolizing other companies, in my opinion. Okay, I'm going to follow up because I agree with everything August just said, and it dovetails in with Lisa's thinking on this. You know, we're companies located in the Midwest. And what I see happening all the time is that folks from outside of Wisconsin or outside the Midwest will take messages from the coast. And they try to use those messaging, that marketing, that messaging with Wisconsin companies. And it just does not work. Um, last year, there was a large movement in the fossil fuel space to say divest, so, so consumers are saying companies, divest from um, fossil fuels. I resonate with that personally. I think that's a great message. The reality is that message doesn't fly very well in the Midwest. But what does fly in the Midwest is that you need to know who your audience is. And specifically, if your audience are younger people, when I say younger, I'm saying 40 and under, could be 35 and under, it's talking the Gen Zers and the younger millennials. What they want is they want transparency, they want authenticity, and they want to be able to see as this company living its values, okay? And so if you are a company and you've always talked about carbon and climate, and you've been a climate advocate for 10 years, 
your consumers are going to know that based on the stories that you've been telling about climate and carbon over the last 10 years. But if all of a sudden tomorrow your company starts talking about climate and carbon and you've never addressed it before, think about what the audience is going to say. They're going to say they're not being authentic, right? And so we have to understand it's really complex, the messaging that we use, but the core of all of the messaging is authenticity. And authenticity comes back to honesty, your brand, and what has your brand said and done over time? Now, yes, your brand can evolve, as August said, and we should all be looking towards evolving. But the reality is just because something is hot one minute doesn't mean that you need to jump on that bandwagon of storytelling. You need to look at what's really authentic with your brand and how does your brand ran. Now, with that said, I truly believe that businesses should advocate for public policy changes that are equitable and that impact everyone. So I think that's very important. And I really enjoy companies that are very vocal about that. August and I, and I'm sure Rochelle has shopped at too. There's a company here in Wisconsin called Penzi, Penzi Spices. They're actually global. They're all over the United States now. But Penzi for years has been a very public advocate for inclusion of diversity, um, gay rights, gay marriage. I mean, environmental change, climate change. And they, and to the point, they put billboards out talking about this. So, okay, we're getting to time. So I'm gonna stop talking about Penzi, but my point is that's part of their brand identity. So when something big happens politically, I expect to get an email from the owner of Penzi Spices saying, this is why we're doing what we're doing right now. All right, thank you guys so much. Um, we ran a little bit over, um, you know, and it, uh, I didn't want to cut off some, some great conversation there. I, I will say for sure that, uh, you know, if something's not able to be addressed in Q&A, that you have a question, please feel free to reach out to the panelists um, individually or to the marketers group as a whole, and we'll make sure to try and get an answer back to you on your thoughts. So uh, this is officially the last gasp of the webinar and wanted to see what um, questions that the group might have to pose for the panel. If there's not anything in the chat, feel free to come off of mute and uh, pose the question not, directly. Not all at once. <laughs> <laughs> you know, one thing, <clears throat> excuse me, while we're waiting for some questions, I think it's really important to touch on a couple of other things. We really didn't dive deep into reporting, but but it is an important element of, um, not, of trying not to greenwash, of really um, impactful storytelling and finding ways, um, looking within the B Corp community to see what kind of reports are being created, what kind of action is taking place can be a really great model or inspiration for other companies that are that are out there trying to find their way, trying to be more impactful in how they approach it and more, more authentic. Um, and, and one thing that I love personally is <clears throat> I like to surround myself with smart people that are smarter than me, whether it's in team building or in sustainability programming. And I think looking to partners to help you navigate the storytelling element, keeping it real, helping, helping um, give you the messaging to help drive deeper on impact with your storytelling can be a really amazing uh, tool and support in the storytelling process. We have a shy marketers. Well, how is that possible? Um, <laughs> if no one has any questions, I'm happy to wrap up with um, some next steps just to give everyone some grounding. Um, oh, Becca, please, by all means. Do you want to pose that out loud? Sure. Um, I was just looking at some of the folks on the line, realizing that some people here are representing either global or national brands. And Lisa, you brought up the need to sometimes think about your micro audience. And I was wondering how a company of that size or covering so many different regions, how would they approach that? I'll take a quick stab at this. One of the things we like to talk about in Wisconsin is um, hyper, hyper localization or you know, meeting people where they're at. So for example, I'm just gonna use Wisconsin as an example, messaging in Milwaukee sometimes is very different than messaging in Milwaukee. Not that they don't have similar core tenants, but city of Milwaukee behaves very differently than the city of Madison. So I think it's understanding the audience where you're at, you know? So uh, for national marketers or national brands, I mean, it's understanding how the Midwest is different than it is on the coast. 
you know, and I think sometimes we see all this data, but the data maybe isn't as accurate as talking to people on the ground. So I think that's also why it's important to actually talk to the folks in a qualitative way. So not just look at quantitative, but have qualitative data, focus groups and working with people on the ground to see what messages resonate. Because I tell you what, even between Wisconsin and Michigan, the messages don't always resonate. Does that make sense? It does, Lisa, and I would add like tapping your internal constituents in your regional offices is really important because they are the feet on the ground. They've got their ear to the ground in terms of, of what's happening in their region and, and being able to collect that and have a regular dialogue and a feedback loop that's in place is really critical to, to getting the insights and keeping them updated and fresh to, to influence and evolve programming. Yeah, I think even just the idea of using panels made, made up of our stakeholders as a marketer mm -hmm. are really, really great idea. So that you have employees, you have consumers, exactly. um, you have pers even perspective variations on those, um, community members, all of those can be involved in helping you to, to shape your marketing message responsibly. Um, any other questions? Otherwise, I can talk really briefly about next steps. All right. Well, like I said, uh, everyone, I've, I'm seeing panelists put their contact information into the chat. So feel free to reach out and to the um, marketers group as a whole. The um, uh, the Beehive has a group for the US Canada Marketers Network and there's some great conversations in there. So if you're not yet a member of that group, I encourage you to join um, and, and post and ask questions. Um, we've also put together a resource guide that's linked to from the presentation, which you'll get a link to as well. Um, so that resource guide has a lot of tips. It also has links to some of the things we've been talking about. Um, and I know it's possible that even some of the people on this call might have contributed to some of those that thought leadership. Uh, we're always looking for uh, new and diverse voices for these kinds of webinars. So if you're interested in, in being a part of or running your own, please also reach out to us because we want this to be a reflection of our entire community and, and not just a few marketers. So the marketing US Canada marketers group is fairly new. So you might see some of us a little more often, but the, the hope is that more and more people get involved and step up um, and, and also contribute because we were looking from, for the entire community to contribute their diverse voices that we need to be a success. Um, anything else any of the panelists or Becca or Tim wanna say in closing before we wrap up? I think the best thing is the most important is in that document that Adrian has, there's a list of action items that everybody can take that we think are, we think of as being B Corp specific things. Like you can write an article for Be The Change as one of them. Right, Adrian? There's a great list of things. Thanks for reminding me. Yeah, we actually put a list of things that were meant to be low effort, higher return. So that, you know, just to get people off with a running start, things like, like Lisa mentioned, like writing for Be The Change, which has 100,000 subscribers. That's an amazing list size that we can get in or getting into the Beehive group for US, uh, for the Impact Media group. And there's been people posting that they're looking for guests to be on their podcasts. So you can show up and tell your impact story on someone's podcast. Um, you know, Rochelle's idea about creating surveys. There's lots of really quick, easy, easy things to get started. So I know that I personally walk away from these webinars often feeling kind of overwhelmed. And the hope is with this resource guide that you can find a few things that are just easy, quick, and give you a sense of accomplishment that you can build on. So that's what we'd love to do for you. And awesome. I don't have anything else to say, so I guess we will. Great conversation, y'all. It was really good. Thank you so much for the opportunity and for being able to, to speak with all of y'all. It was really great. Thanks for coming, everyone. And thanks, Thank panelists much. and Becca and Tim. Appreciate Thank everything. You. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye.